Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's amazing to see so many people in the room. I didn't really expect this. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I work for Actus um, and lead their organizational change uh, and governance practice. It basically means I just try and shape how we as a company deliver uh, change across all our various projects. Um, my background is primarily in security and justice type projects, um, working for the likes of DFID, FCO, uh, MOD. Um, yeah, and I've worked in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, and I currently work a lot in uh, Somaliland. Um, but I also work with the Change Management Institute uh, with Mel. I co-lead the London chapter. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great organisation. Basically, all we do is bring together change man management professionals from a whole range of sectors and just debate issues that, that people see. Uh, so it's, for me, it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, tonight we're going to talk about change management in security and justice. And I mean, for me, it's really the big question is, are there any insights we can gain, new perspectives that maybe can help us do our work in security and justice? Um, I, mean, I first got into kind of the idea of change um, when I was working in Afgan Afghanistan very early on in my career. Um, you know, I was based in Kabul, working on a different project with the Ministry of Interior. Uh, and it was a pretty tough place to work. Uh, it was exciting, but it was very, very tough. And I kind of, kind of made me realize how little we actually knew uh, about how to bring about change. We kind of knew how to uh, change maybe uh, procedures or policy or introduce new systems. Uh, but changing behavior was pretty much beyond us. And it was probably because it was so complex there. You know, lots of political dynamics, uh, vested interests, lots of very, very confusing power dynamics. Uh, it, just made, it just made our work lack the kind of sticky quality of change that you need to make <coughs> it sustainable. Um, so when I left Afghanistan, I kind of went in search of answers. Uh, there we go. Uh, but I didn't really find them in uh, the development space. Um, there's a lot of critiques, but not, not too many solutions. So I decided to kind of go beyond development uh, in search of new ideas. Uh, and that kind of led me to uh, change management. And it kind of seemed to make sense in many respects, because here was a field that was all about taking an organization from one status quo to a new status quo and trying to manage that journey in between uh, with a whole range of techniques, uh, frameworks, methodologies. Uh, and ways of thinking about change that uh, could make our lives a bit easier. But as I digged in further and further more, uh, digged into the topic and got more involved in change management, I kind of started to realize that some of the debates they were having were actually very similar to the debates that, that we were having. And therefore, there were kind of insights that we could gain and maybe shortcuts to innovation that if we just opened our ears and, and listened. Um, so we're kind of going to we're going to look at some of those debates now, which I hope are going to be quite familiar in some ways. But just try to cast a slightly different light on them. So there'll be complexity, agility, uh, and people. Uh, so yeah, complexity. I mean, this is a bit of an obvious statement. Um, you know, we deal with very complex problems in security and justice, uh, and you know they're complex for good reasons. Some of which I mentioned a second ago. Um, and it all basically makes our life pretty hard, makes the job pretty hard. Uh, well, the change management world uh, also has to deal with quite a lot of complexity. You know, big mergers, huge acquisitions, uh, big technological shifts, big behavioral change programs, you know, programs that can cut across geographies, uh, cut across kind of organizational cultures, and even national cultures. So I'm sure you know, Melanie can kind of testify to some of the complexity there. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the field has had to evolve to deal with that complexity. Um, partly in, re in, re in the realization that there's lots of there's a lot of danger that comes with misunderstanding that complexity, uh, and that danger comes with unintended consequences, which can be pretty severe. Uh, and just to kind of give you a kind of highlight what I mean by unintended consequences, I'm just going to give you a little example. So, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, 1800s, uh, they want to uh, increase the number of deer, so they take a very simple and rational choice to increase, uh, to hand feed those deer. Well, they hand fed those deer and the population grew. Uh, the only problem was those deer used to eat the bark off trees. Uh, it was okay when there weren't too many of them, but because of the bigger population, 
it meant more, more bark was getting eaten and more trees were getting damaged. Well, beavers used to use those trees to build dams. So they had less trees to build their dams, which meant less dams. Or well, trout used to lay their, lay their eggs uh, in the offering of the river by those dams. So from a very simple, what seemed like a very simple decision, uh, was actually incredibly complex. So the more deer you have had, uh, the less trout you had. So now picture deer in your mind. Now picture <coughs> where you work. I don't always think the leap between those two places is so great. Um, so in recognition of this complexity, uh, the field has kind of come to realize the limitations um, of experts, of the expert mindset. You know, the expert mindset says that you go into an organization uh, and you try to analyze all the various causes and effects of a problem. <coughs> you try to find all the dysfunctional parts, uh, all the parts that are missing, and then you diagnose what the problem is and then you provide a remedy. Uh, the only problem is, under complexity, this kind of approach doesn't really always work so well. Things are a lot less clear, they're a bit messy, and a whole lot uh, more unpredictable. Uh, so the change management world has started to evolve its, its mindset. There are still people with that expert mindset, but they are trying to evolve it. Uh, and I, here's a nice little framework which uh, is in use, uh, which basically breaks down uh, the context uh, the, the decision-making context to four domains. So simple, complicated, complex, chaotic. We're going to leave chaotic to the side. So simple is, well, it's pretty simple. Uh, cause and effect are really obvious, uh, and therefore the solution is super obvious. It's kind of like what, asking what's two plus two. You don't need to be really be an expert to answer that question. Uh, with complicated, there tends to be uh, multiple answers to a problem. Uh, and to get and to really to get at those answers, you need to analyze the cause and effects. Problem is, it's a bit more like complex algebra. Uh, so you basically need the right expertise to understand the cause and effect. So in this kind of complicated domain, as long as you have that right the right expertise, you can find the solution. Well, in complex, um, those cause and effect relationships are much harder to get at. Uh, they're a lot less clear. Uh, and to outsiders, they're often hidden to our eyes. In this domain, our expertise doesn't mean quite as much. Uh, and often, you're, you're better off letting go of any preconceived notions for how the world works or any, pre or any assumptions for how the world works. Now, what I've said over there, if you, I don't know if you can see, but a lot of our projects, <coughs> I would contend, exist in the complex domain. Um, we can probably debate that a little bit later. Uh, but, I'd like, but I also contend that a lot of us kind of hang out in the complicated domain uh, because of this identity around being the expert and therefore providing the solution. Uh, now, if you do believe in this framework, it does also suggest a way to deal with the complexity. What it suggests is rather than overanalyze those cause and effect relationships, uh, instead you probe the complexity. So you probe with a little bit of action to see what kind of response you get back. And you, gradually, and you do that again and again and again, gradually iterating your way to a solution. And that leads me to my next point, agility. So to deal with this complex environment, the change management world has started to adopt agile methodologies, primarily to operationalize this understanding of complexity. Uh, and what we're seeing now is a greater uptake of more hypothesis-led approaches uh, that iterate towards the solution. Uh, where interventions become more of a, a more of a multi-step process that allows well that is made of a lot of small steps rather than one big one that weeds out bad ideas that seem to like good ideas and then allows you to build on those ideas that work whereby you learn about the complexity through short adaptive cycles of action. Now, this way of thinking isn't necessarily all that new. Um, you know, Matt Andrews has made it quite popular uh, through PDIA, where the I and the A stand for iterative and adaptive. Um, but in a lot of the conversations I've had with lots of professionals in the field, they're often scratching their heads around how do we actually be iterative and adaptive. Now, part of the problem, of course, is on the, on the donor side. But the other side of the problem is the, method, the approach and the methodologies to be iterative and adaptive in a controlled manner. 
Well, the change management world is debating this as well. Uh, and we held a debate, the CMI, the Change Management Institute, back in October, uh, and even produced a report, which you can see there. If you want a copy, uh, just ask me. Um, yeah, we brought together change professionals from a whole range of sectors. Um, and it was a fascinating discussion because it, it did show that they were grappling with many of the same issues that we were. Um, some were far more familiar, familiar in agile methodologies. Others were pretty new to it. Um, but they were all facing very similar challenges in actually implementing it. Um, but as well as debating it, they're also coming up with some of the answers. Um, so here's, I just threw up three, three books. There's, there's a whole, whole range of resources you can kind of go to. Uh, the first book is Agile Change Management, uh, which actually, uh, it's Melanie's book. I'll get commission for every book she sells from now. Um, but it is, it's just, a, she, you know, she's, a, she's a practitioner with years and years of experience, and that book represents a very practical approach to integrating an agile methodology with a change management approach, uh, with a really practical iterative process that you can follow, with a whole range of tools and techniques integrated into that that can allow, allow you to be iterative and adaptive. Uh, the book in the middle is Change by Design by Tim Brown. Uh, he's a, a guru in, in design thinking. Um, now, design thinking just gives you a way to think about change. Um, but the book itself gives you a very iterative process, again, that you can follow, uh, and one that emphasizes um, safe-to-fail experimentation. So it's quite an interesting book. Lean Change Management, well, lean is just another word for agile, um, where we have someone called Jason Little, who, again, has integrated some to Melanie, an agile methodology with a change management approach. So all I'm saying, there's answers out there that we can lean on and find kind of shortcuts to innovation rather than trying to make it up from scratch. Uh, now, there's one common theme uh, that cuts across uh, all of these approaches that you see here, uh, and that is people. Um, they're very human-centered approaches. That's the kind of lingo they use. Um, and, that's, and all it means is they put people at the heart of change, and it's not just the leaders of, leaders of an organization. It's actually a whole cross-section of an organization. They argue it has to be at the heart of, of change. And that's because uh, they realize that to solve very complex problems, you can't only rely on your expertise. Uh, instead, you, need, you have to draw on the people who are embedded in that complexity. Because collectively, they probably have a far better understanding uh, of the complexity than you. Uh, and probably can help you a navigator. That brings me to a final point, um, which is around people. Um, so we use, obviously, these methodologies draw on people to, to solve very complex problems. Um, but it's not just a data mining kind of exercise where we mine them for their solutions and then go ahead and implement them. Uh, Ultimately, what we're trying to do is change the way people behave, right? Uh, and that's kind of what makes it hard, you know, because people come with a whole lot of baggage. Um, you've got egos, you've got aspirations, you've got fears, you've got insecurities, things that motivate you, things that don't. Uh, and we, kind of, we can kind of relate to this in our kind of personal lives. Um, you know, we embrace certain changes, so like getting married or, or buying a new house, uh, getting a new job, it's pretty exciting. Other behaviors are a bit more persistent and hard to change, so uh, any smokers in the room, you know, um, you keep smoking despite knowing, knowing the risks. Uh, exercise, people who don't exercise, you know, they, we all know the benefits of exercise. Uh, those of us who, may, who set New Year's resolutions uh, and don't keep them, it always happens to me. Um, and what it comes down to is how is people's minds, at least for me anyway, people's minds uh, and people's hearts and how you engage them. Um, problem with that, of course, is that the mind and the heart don't always agree. And that's the challenge. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a nice little analogy now. Uh, so there's two systems uh, in the brain uh, that really influence the way you act, the way you behave. Um, the rational part of your brain 
is the one that kind of deliberates, it analyzes, and you can think of it as the rider on that elephant holding the reins. Um, the other part of your brain is the emotional side. Uh, this is the part that kind of is instinctive, uh, feels pain, uh, feels pleasure. Um, and you can think of that as the elephant. Now, of course, the rider sits on top of that elephant and holds the reins and can appear to be the leader. Uh, but anyone who's ridden on top of an elephant will know that if that elephant wants to go in another direction, it's got a five-ton uh, advantage. Um, so let's take that for a second and <coughs> use a very simple example. Um, we use um, purpose of a project. So every change management project, as all projects do, have a purpose. Uh, it's basically a story behind change. It tells people why they should change. Well, we often approach it by, with lots of facts and figures, uh, lots of analysis of the problems. Uh, it's all quite rational, you know, a rational argument to change someone's mind. The only problem with that, of course, it only speaks to the rider. Um, it only speaks to the rider. And it's quite a conventional model, um, which I've thrown up here. Uh, which goes where well, the process goes, analyze, think, change. Uh, where you analyze all the information you can get hold of. Uh, you present really convincing kind of arguments for why things need to change. Uh, and the hope, the hope is that that changes the way people think and that changes, that leads to the change. Now, the problem with that is that, lead, well, one, the limitations of kind of analytical tools that we have available to us, given the complexity, given how hard it is to understand the causes and effects, you might not be able to actually analyze the problem sufficiently. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that no one really ever got excited about a load of analysis. Um, you know, motivation uh, is more of a feeling word than it is thinking. And so you end up with a, an elephant that's not, not that motivated uh, and is probably pretty scared because you just told them all these problems. Now, there's a lot of research that suggests that the process for change is more like, more like this. See, feel, change. Where people need to see compellingly why they need to change. They need to believe it. They need to care. Uh, they then need to see the solutions for themselves compellingly. And they need to kind of care about it. And through that process, you motivate the elephant. Um, but you also dampen any kind of emotion that might get in the way. Um, now, let me just pause right there for a second and give you another little antidote. Um, there's a famous behavioral study um, that's been conducted all over the world. Um, you basically take 10 participants uh, and they enter them into a lottery uh, with the promise of a prize. Now, Five of those participants are given uh, lottery tickets with numbers already on them. Five people are given lottery tickets uh, and told to write their own numbers on. And just before the lottery numbers are drawn, the researchers ask, can I buy back those tickets? And regardless of where this experiment takes place, regardless of demographics, the results are always the same. Uh, and they, fi they find they have to pay f five times more um, for the tickets of those people who handscribed their numbers. Now, this shows, this is quite, uh, reveals something about human nature. When we make the choice for ourselves, we tend to be more committed to the outcome. So part of the sea field change uh, process has to be about letting the rider and the elephant <coughs> write their own story, where we are more facilitators of the process rather than subject matter experts, primarily because when we apply that expert uh, lens to the problem, we tend to stifle the very thing that makes change happen. And that's the energy and the motivation that you need for change to stick. Uh, so let me introduce myself again. Hello, I am Arthur, and I am a facilitator of change. And so just to sum up, you know, we deal with very complex problems, we know that. Uh, but the complexity means that we don't necessarily always have the answers. Uh, and if we can accept that, then we're going to be more open to more, to more experimental, hypothesis-led approaches. 
where we recognize that we, that with each iteration, we're learning more and more about the context, learning about complexity and what's going to work, what's going to stick. But of course, you know, people have to be at the heart of that. And again, it's not just the people at the top of an organization. It's a, it's a whole cross-section of an organization um, where we have to kind of let them write their own story. Because if we do that, we'll have a five-ton advantage. And that is me from now. Great. Uh, so, we'll, so we'll switch over to assignments. Are you going to kick off? Uh, yeah, I'll kick off if you've got a little presentation. Take us away. OK. Well, first of all, thank you, Arthur. Um, my task will be to move from the, uh, the, the salmon and the deers to, uh, to real life in Tunisia with security sector reform. Um, <laughs> And uh, hopefully Khaled will be able to deliver most of this presentation. So as some of you got the original invite would have seen, it's uh, Khaled Salim's name on there as team leader for our work out in, uh, out in Tunisia and, and not mine. Uh, I'm the regional uh, project manager for Axis projects in North Africa and have whisked back um, just for 24 hours to, to help out, particularly if there's any technical difficulties. Uh, but I'll, I'll kick off and uh, Khaled, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you know when, uh, when you're on and uh, I'll control the, uh, the slides from here. Um, so first of all, um, in terms of actors in uh, Tunisia and the work we've been doing on security sector reform, um, we won't go into that in sh uh, too much detail during this presentation because I'm conscious of the time, but obviously can in the Q&A. Um, but actors have been in Tunisia uh, working on two UK-funded projects uh, since late 2013. And I'm delighted to see that we have Hema Katetra in the room, who was the uh, original project officer before, before my time on the, uh, the first of those projects there, the Ministry of Interior Strategic Planning Programme, and, uh, and designed the second one, which we're currently uh, finishing up towards the end of March, uh, strategic assistance to the Tunisian security sector. So during that time, we've, uh, we've built up a team of, uh, including myself, uh, who are full-time staff, 12 full-time staff out in Tunisia, um, out in Tunis, in Lamassa, where uh, Khaled is, uh, is right now. Um, the overall objective uh, is nothing too new within SSR programs, broadly to assist uh, with the creation uh, of a more efficient, effective, uh, and responsive security sector. So nothing too new there. What we're going to try and do in the next 10, 15 minutes or so is to try and uh, explain how we've used some of the sort of inferences, some of the philosophies from the change management world to start to change some of the, uh, the programmatic approaches um, to these two projects, particularly with the, with the second one. So how have, we, how have we done that in Tunisia? First of all, which is a, is a big step, is, is recognizing uh, the complexity uh, that Arthur discussed in a, in a broader sense. Um, I think, uh, I'm sure practitioners around the room here would all uh, agree with, its uh, with the complexity of SSR in general, um, both uh, th that you don't know beforehand, but also the changing environment that we're always working in. And accepting, the key point is to accept that we will never completely understand that. Um, this then transfers into three uh, broad areas that we've taken on in terms of our programmatic approach uh, for the projects in Tunisia, particularly, the, particularly this, uh, the, the most recent one that we're currently finishing off. So the first of these is to take an iterative uh, and agile uh, programmatic approach. And uh, Khaled in particular will talk about how we've actually done that. Secondly is to focus in terms of activities more on methodologies and tools, coaching, uh, rather than transplanting um, solutions um, from other contexts or from other p people's personal experiences uh, as experts. So this, again, sort of has a nod to the work of Matt Andrews in the PDIA uh, approach. And then third is taking a very particip participatory approach, uh, which links closely with that, uh, with the second point. This takes, uh, takes heed of the, uh, of the points that Arthur was mentioning around the, uh, the elephant and the rider. Uh, the behavioral people aspects of change, um, but also uh, enables us to fill some of the, 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 the evolving picture that we, the environment that we don't understand, and also to broaden the support base for, for change programs that, that we need to increase sustainability and mean that the SSR programs are less tied to specific individuals. Um, so uh, this is the last slide, Halid, I'll cover and then I'll pass over to you. Um, the com the complexity within Tunisia, so we have all the general complexities of doing an SSR program, uh, which Arthur touched on. Um, then I think specifically with Tunisia, certainly from, from my experience, is uh, unlike some other development environments uh, in terms of a, a few different areas. So first of all, it, 
It is not a particularly, there's, there's, there's troubling inequality and social unrest as we, as we speak in Tunisia. And with, I'm missing a curfew, so I'm very glad to be in, in London uh, rather than in Tunis right now. Um, but it's in general uh, an upper middle income um, country. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the mindset of the average Tunisian uh, would compare itself, look northwards um, to Europe as well. So you're in less of a, uh, a position to think that small change, and this is, this, this is a wider issue with Tunisia at the moment, but small change is, is accepted. Their ambitions are very, very high for what they want to do. They're also perhaps harder to uh, dictate to in other environments, perhaps as, as the third sub-bullet point there, in terms of you know, there's no fixed external military presence or, or foreign presence in the country. Um, so we must use even more the, the behavioural side, the persuasion, the ownership, all these sides come out very, uh, very strongly. Um, and a lack of stability, um, that's not unique, of course, um, but um, certainly, uh, you know, in our time there, I think with three, three or so governments, we have our social unrest, as a curfew on at the moment, uh, very, um, uh, uh, in 2015, obviously a lot of international press around the terrorist attacks that's going on. So a lot of, a lot of movement, uh, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is going on in Tunisia right now. Khaled, I will flick over to you. So if you are unmute, we'll hopefully hear you to talk about the, the MOI specifically within Tunisia. Hello? Hello. Yeah. First of all, to check my voice, is it clear? Yeah, it's I think clear. we're good. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, first of all, and thanks for uh, this invitation. It's my honor to be with you. And at the same time, working for ACTIS uh, since uh, two years in, uh, in Tunis. Uh, I'll follow from uh, what uh, Simon mentioned about uh, complexity, and now we are talking about uh, the MOI level. Maybe I'll talk more practically about what we mean about lack of stability within uh, the MOI. Let's say, first of all, about the political uh, stability. And one of the examples is before uh, the uh, last election, uh, there was a minister of interior, Ben Jeddu. Uh, after the election, we have like another minister, and uh, last month we have like a third minister, which means that in less than two years, we have three ministers. What's the implication of that? Each minister, to some extent, brings his team, his new team, his new approach, and to some extent, there is a lack of continuity uh, in work. This is one of uh, like uh, the examples of the lack of stability within the MOI. Another, let's say, another example about what we mean by uh, by that: that uh, each uh, in each uh, August uh, there is a change in uh, the structure and responsibilities within uh, the MOI, uh, which uh, make it which makes you know, a challenging, uh, which makes a uh, challenging to keep working within the same uh, within the same team. Let's say that we started with uh, uh, ex people uh, talking about strategic planning, uh, change management. Uh, you don't know maybe the next month or uh, after that you will find them uh, moved uh, to other like districts or uh, positions because this is uh, the policy within uh, the MOI. Uh, maybe also we can talk about personal interest and uh, interventions from uh, political uh, politicians uh, in the internal environment of the Minister of Interior, uh, which uh, I think that uh, in addition to politicians also it's like a kind of uh, uh, relations with the uh, businessmen. One of the examples that uh, a big uh, like debate uh, in the last year uh, in the Minister of Interior about uh, this kind of interventions between two like big businessmen in uh, Tunis. Uh, one of them uh, pretend that there is like uh, the Minister of Interior spying on him uh, for the sake of uh, other business uh, man and he provided the documents from the Minister of Interior after that investigation uh, in the ministry, the result of fire like 10 key people from the ministry. So this kind of like different aspects, it's uh, indications about this lack of stability within uh, the MOI. I think that uh, we have uh, in this slide also about confidentiality, legacy of secrecy and suspicious, which is uh, a part of the uh, Ben Ali era, uh, personal in uh, interests, clans, uh, high political uh, situation within the Minister of Interior. And then uh, on the last point, uh, we have what we call it and what we get used to say the internal politics within the Minister of Interior. 
that uh, our uh, the project we are implementing for uh, the UK government it is like a bilateral project. So our channel is with the, the bilateral department in the Ministry of Interior. Unfortunately, there is another department which is the multilateral uh, department. So most of the time you have this kind of internal politics that the multilateral try to push back because it is within the uh, bilateral. The same thing in the bilateral, they try to push back anything come from the multilateral and there is a lot of harmony or a unified approach. Even we try most of the time to bring uh, all people uh, uh, to the same table in order to assure that we can mitigate to some extent this kind of risk. Maybe the next slide. Now, what was the implications of complexity on uh, uh, our work in Tunis? And on one side, that uh, I think that Arthur mentioned about the expert, and uh, sometimes people pretend that they can come up with solutions. Fortunately, that we are in actus try to accept that we can never understand the context completely. We try, but we will not pretend that we understand the context uh, completely. Uh, as you can see uh, through our engagement, through the uh, direct uh, engagement with the different key stakeholders in the Ministry of Interior or other ministers, because we are working also with other ministries, we try to learn and to adapt during uh, the project. Uh, and we can try to adapt through like uh, three different approaches, as mentioned maybe by Arthur and by Simon, uh, the agile approach, and focus on tools and methodologies in addition to emphasize the participatory approach. Maybe I'll take uh, the, the, the second point and the third point, which is uh, the focus on tools and uh, methodologies. Because, you know, there is a re it's, it's risky when you are working with security sector to come up with solutions related to the content. This is on one side. On the other side, it will be perceived by the Tunisian people as a kind of intervention or that one size fit everywhere, which means that you have like your own set of mind, you have your own solutions, and you try to uh, impose it on the Tunisian. So it's better uh, as an approach to adapt this kind of complexity and to learn more about the context and to get the buy-in and uh, the leadership from the Tunisian side to focus more in the tools and the methodologies. And one of the, folk, uh, the tools and the methodologies we uh, used to assess their strategic planning capacities is the E4C, which is the alignment uh, fortune. And I'll come uh, later to talk a little bit about that. The second one, which is the participatory approach. An example today, which is uh, we were uh, like conducting a coaching session with four ministries, Ministry of uh, Tourism, uh, Justice, uh, Customs, uh, and Agriculture. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, the discussion was about how they can enhance uh, their strategic planning uh, approach and process. And when we mentioned uh, by question, guys, what do you think that the main challenge? Uh, Muhammad, one of uh, the customs officers, came with the answer. There is a lack of participation, which means that uh, decisions taken in the high level, uh, few people, and there is a lack of participation. So we try most of the time to, emph to emphasize that participation is uh, the right approach in one side to understand more the context, to understand the complexity you are facing. You can understand by participation different perspective uh, toward the pressing uh, threats uh, Tunis is facing and you are facing. At the same time, it will uh, create in one side uh, the buy-in, the understanding, and at the same time, the leadership. I do remember the four words we get used to use with the Tunisian, with our partners in the Tunisian side. And the four words that there is ownership, leadership, support, and facilitation. And we get used to tell them the first two words fully, it's yours, which means that who own, who lead this project, it's you. And we are here to provide you with this kind of technical support through methodologies and the process and to facilitate uh, that kind of process. So uh, to deal with uh, this kind of complex uh, complexity within the Tunisian uh, system, uh, as I mentioned, agile, agility and uh, focusing on uh, the methodologies and the tools at the same time to emphasize uh, the participatory uh, approach. Can I go to the next one, brother?
the uh, the agile approach slide up with the from the donor's okay. perspective now? You know, from the donor perspective, uh, uh, you mentioned to our like best friend, and it's like a pleasure to have uh, Hama also with with you uh, there. Who's uh, and I'm not accommodating. She's uh, the champion of uh, what's happened in Tunis, uh, and she created, I think, that the mindset and an approach which is to have most of the time a joint strategy, which means that there is uh, like a complex situation. It's difficult to come up with uh, full answers from the first day. So in order to tackle with this kind of complexity, you have to keep close uh, relation, close uh, uh, discussions, uh, consultations with uh, uh, the FCO and uh, the uh, uh, embassy here in, in Tunis. I'll take an example, which is uh, the new minister of interior, uh, Al-Hadi. And when he came, there is a lot of questions how we can uh, deal with uh, this guy. On one side, we use to some extent like three, four uh, strategies. One, to use uh, uh, the power uh, and the commitment of the people who uh, participated in the program to uh, advocate internally about the importance of the continuation of uh, the program, the benefit behind that kind of uh, strategic planning uh, institutionalization process. Uh, we have like channels like Sonia and others uh, in the Minister of Interior. At the same time, we keep the channels with uh, uh, Ouni, who is the head of the, the bilateral, or with uh, Ben Rabih, the head, the, the, the DG of the international relation. But here I come to the uh, FCO. The uh, FCO team, the embassy team here in Tunis, uh, at the same time working with their counterpart in the Minister of Interior to facilitate and to assure uh, the momentum. The uh, ambassador, as an example, yesterday met with the Minister of Interior to keep this kind of message and momentum, which means that uh, most of the time this kind of regular consultations, uh, connections, uh, sorry, meetings, uh, uh, update, uh, coming up with a joint strategy, it's, uh, I think, that uh, one of the main tools uh, to tackle with what we are facing uh, in uh, facing uh, in, in a complex uh, situation. Uh, as, uh, as you know, that uh, part of uh, this agility that we have this weekly meeting with uh, the FCO, uh, we have uh, the quarter uh, report. At the same time, if there is something happening, we directly contact them, try before uh, giving like any commitment or answers to come up with the joint strategy, like what's happened yesterday, when uh, the guy who's working in the Minister of Foreign Affairs and he's uh, the coordinator for the CT strategy in Tunis, the national CT strategy, uh, called us and asked for our support. Directly, we talked to the uh, embassy, we agreed to meet in order to come up with a joint strategy. Today we met with the guy and we, uh, to some extent, expecting that the FCO will meeting him tomorrow or uh, early next week. Uh, this is the way we try uh, to practically uh, to, uh, to use or to, to implement the agile approach uh, in this project. Can we move? Is it okay to move to the next slide, brother? The local partner, no, it's difficult for me. Maybe if you can talk about it, yeah, because it's not clear for me here. Sure. So on the uh, that. thanks, Halid. Um, so on the on the agile approach, it's important, obviously, to have very uh, close relationships both with your uh, with your 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 donor, but also with the uh, with the with the business, as it's known, uh, with the agile terminology that's not specific to development, but I think as we look at it, business being the the local partner who's implementing the solution. Um, and those, you probably can't see it uh, clearly on the slide, but those those um, are the orange sort of blobs. The top circle is around the project, sort of project governance style, so overall direction for a project, uh, of which we also have the, uh, the, the donor, the FCO on there. But we have a business sponsor, business vi visionary. So one thing we haven't managed to do actually this time around that we'd have liked to do, and I think uh, we will try and do in future projects, is set up like other people do on other projects, project governance boards to really have a have a consistent uh, input um, from the uh, from the from the, uh, the the business as it's called in this in this terminology. Uh, we do have in incredible amounts, and Khaled uh, and uh, Omar, are two technical leads, have incredible amounts of meeting at the MOI doing that. But it's not it's not formalised uh, in terms of a rhythm. And um, the second area uh, of involvement is around solution development. So this is more your day to day 
uh, the people who we would have various solution development teams depending on which area of the SSR project we're working on. Um, but Halid referenced one person who works, for instance, on border strategies. So working incredibly closely with those people to design through these uh, coaching uh, methodologies, uh, tools, um, rather than uh, rather than coming up with pre-designed um, systems. Okay, Halid, over, back over to you on to tools and methodologies as the second point. You know here. Uh which is the FRC alignment for change. Uh, in one side, uh, we we are using uh, this tool to uh, assess uh, uh, the strategic planning capacities, and maybe I can put it in a different language. We are, I don't mean that ACTIS, that the Tunisian partners uh, conduct this self-assessment uh, by our coaching, by our technical support that we provide them with the tool. We try to uh, explain what is the tool, what's the content, how uh, you can use it. But at the same time, we put it in this uh, language that this is not like a Bible. It is a tool. So you can modify, you can add. And as an example, what's happened with the Minister of uh, Tourism, instead of having like 18 indicators, which is... Uh, the key indicators in this tool, they added, as an example, a, a, a 19th one. Uh, this is on one side. And the other side, that when we conduct, uh, as uh, when they conduct uh, this uh, assessment for the strategy planning capacities, by having this tool, it means that by themselves, they can discover what they have, what is the current situation, what is the current competences, capacities in their organization, and at the same time, they can define what kind of gaps uh, they are facing uh, and they can come up with their development plan. What's the value of this approach? And this is what I discovered during my engagement with uh, the different uh, entities, ministers, because we started using uh, this tool with the National Guard uh, back. Uh, 2014, September 2014, after that with the National Security, after that with the Public Protection, after that with the Minister of the Interior, and now we are using this tool with uh, another five, six uh, ministries entities. The, the value of this approach, that self-assessment, they own it, they use it, in one side, they, the buy-in for the result of the assessment will be high. It's not like, it's not like Actis uh, expert who, he came, who came up with these uh, results and uh, his own analysis. It is there, which means that the buy-in uh, is there. And at the same time, the buy-in for the solution they propose or they uh, develop, also it is there. Uh, yesterday, as an example, and uh, we discovered that one of the, the people who's working for the Minister of Agriculture uh, translate this tool to uh, a program and put it uh, uh, to be used uh, by uh, the Minister of uh, Agriculture. So today we gave him the space to share it with other ministries and to receive uh, their feedback in order for more development. Also because we have uh, our expert Elliot here in Tunis, so we provide like half an hour to engage between Elliot and this guy in order to provide him with more advice, which means that this, when you provide them with the tools and the methodologies, in one side, they own it, you, they can institutionalize it according to their needs, which means that they tailor it. The results, which is uh, the gaps or the solutions, the buy-in, the ownership for that, it will be high. Why I emphasize too much on that? Because it is easy, as I think that Arthur mentioned, to have an expert who can define the different gaps and come up with a nice uh, document. And this is what happened with different ministries. When I engaged with the Minister of uh, Justice, uh, Sana Abhar, which is, uh, who's uh, the DG of international relations, she told me that Ibnud, Ibnud, which is in French, the UNDB, developed uh, the strategy for the Minister of Justice. My question, so if you have a strategy, what's the problem? Her response was, you know, it is a strategy on paper. We don't know what's the value when we are not part of this process. And your approach, which is ACTIS UK approach, is to build our competences, to have uh, the right skills within the ministry, to build our like system, our process. And after that, we don't need you or 
the UNDP to develop our strategy. We can do it. We can own it. We can implement it. The same case we uh, we, we, we we observe in the Ministry of Tourism because a private sector company developed their their strategy. So by like uh, having these tools and uh, they they own these tools, it means that we provide them. I think that with the right approach to own, to lead, and uh, at the same time to uh, come up with the proper analysis for the gaps or for uh, the solutions. I think that Arthur, Arthur mentioned, we are not here to provide the Tunisians with solutions. Most of the time, Omar or myself, we uh, are providing with a lot of questions. Can we go? I think we Barcelona covered a lot of this, Khaled, but if... Yeah, we covered that. Yeah, yeah we covered that. So I, I don't think that we need to, to, to repeat. Yeah. yeah. I think the final Next. slide that this is, that's worth talking about is this one. Just uh, You've touched on a few of these points, Khaled, but just a few other areas of sort of how we've, how we've tried to make it a participatory, uh, people-focused approach. But if you like, you can talk about it. Yeah, okay. so um, uh, speaking to the, to, to the room uh, here, um, yeah, one of the things, again, this is not... Uh, this is not unique, but I think is 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 essential all the same to having having a team that is based uh, in country that is ready uh, both for planned uh, meetings with uh, local partners, but also being very active. And unfortunately, one of those re reactions means that Halid isn't isn't with us today, but uh, should be very good for the for the project. Um, the other, which is further down, is 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 clearly in terms of you know. Uh, Linguistic skills. Um, I'm the, the odd one out in the pack, and I don't think I'd give myself a, a role right now as the only person that doesn't speak French or Arabic. But uh, the majority, well, actually, all but two of the teams speak Arabic. Over half the teams Tunisian, uh, which I think makes it easier to build those personal relationships to, to speak to the uh, the elephant rather than the the rider uh, all the time. Um, and I think in the general approach that we've had, it's been uh, to focus on many levels uh, and uh, many levels within ministries and uh, contacts outside of ministries as well, both to push uh, forward change at its time, but also to de-risk uh, change being transient uh, to make it more uh, sustainable. Um, and uh, another perhaps, I think, useful thing we did in the second project was have specific activity line and, and therefore budget and, and, and areas to report against, uh, which is perhaps may come up in the Q&A, how, how does this really link to uh, projects, uh, donors, how they, how they design them at the moment, but having an activity line for individual sessions to create that demand. Um, so we've got that joint understanding with, uh, with, with the donor um, to allow for that. And then lastly, the, you know, the main point which goes through uh, sort of all three areas really is, is giving um, the sense of ownership um, uh, to uh, to the Tunisians themselves, and at minimum co-creation, if not uh, them very much leading on that. Um, so with that, I think we're done, Halad. I don't know if you've got any final words that you want to say, and otherwise it'd be great to have you around for the, the Q&A as well. No, it's, I think that's more than enough. Thank you. Okay. If there's any questions, I'm available. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, all really interesting. We're going to just hand over briefly, five, ten minutes, if that's okay. Uh, to Melanie, who can uh, provide us a few, five is, five is good, um, a few quick reflections on that, and then we'll open it up for a discussion between everyone here. Well, I think my reflections were about um, how an awful lot of what was said really does apply to um, a lot of the work that I do for organisations in the private sector, in the third sector, and the public sector. Um, I think the first most important point is that change, um, and this is over 20 years, I will definitely say this, Change can only be successful if everyone takes the decision to participate. Because whatever change we decide upon, however structural, however strategic it is, ultimately it filters down to everybody that they have to work maybe in only a slightly different way, sometimes slightly more radically, but they have to decide to work differently. And that might be that they have to use a different system when they log on in the mornings, or they have to use more security passwords because we've decided system security is our transformation. Or sometimes it means that they have to work with different people or they have to redesign their processes. But it strikes me as ironic that we spend an awful lot of time in transformational change, talking to sort of senior leaders and getting the strategy and the scope right, when actually the, the really where change really happens is right down at the bottom where people decide for themselves this is the change that I'm going to have to make if this bigger thing is actually going to be achieved and you only get them to that point if you've actually involved them 
all the way through. A good example of this, um, my nightmare, I think, from the last 18 months, was that I, I work um, uh, alongside Saudi Electricity Company. You've got 35,000 staff, and they are doing 24 transformational change programs simultaneously that's changing everything, systems and structures and culture and uh, uh, a greater emphasis on customer service, um, Saudi Electricity Company becoming a, a, um, a Kingdom of Saudi Arabia national champion. Nobody can tell me what that means, but it sounded really good. Um, so 24 massive programs. And so the board is on board. So there's about seven or eight of those, depending on how you count. Uh, they set up a transformational change office, 12 to 14 people. Um, and then we had 24 program managers for each of the 24 programs, and they each had a sponsor, so that's 48 involved. And then for each of those programs, we started with a sort of team of about six project managers, so six times 24. And then we started off with, well, for each of those projects, we probably ought to have a sponsor, and then each of those projects probably ought to have a team. So we are getting people involved, but it's only when you then divide that number, which is by now a few hundred, by 35,000, then we perhaps catch the point that actually we haven't actually engaged everybody. What we've done is we've sort of moved the responsibility for managing the change further down the chain, but not that far down. And there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who have absolutely no clue what you mean when you talk about the, um, uh, the strategic change program in Saudi electricity. Um, they sort of gave the game away, actually, when the chief executive did his um, national tour and none of them knew what he was talking about and then he lost his temper and then it all started again. Um, so first things first, you have to involve everybody. Second thing, I totally agree with what's been said tonight, that actually I think our job as change experts, practitioners, call it what you will, is that we are there to share our knowledge of um, or to implement perhaps structure around whatever the change is, because actually the solution isn't ours. The only people that can devise the solution are the ones that are going to be impacted by it. So where we can be beneficial, I think, is helping to put in place things like a life cycle of the change activities, um, to try to identify what all the change activities might be so things don't get forgotten, and to try to create a structure that is, is very agile, because actually I think we need to do multiple iterations because effective change builds on the excitement of one little thing going well and therefore people being feeling the confidence to do the next bit of change. So I think this agile approach, which is a terribly trendy word really for sort of nudging people um, towards the ultimate sort of goal, we can sort of try to work out what the ultimate outcome is and we can sort of try to nudge people towards it. But that the structure that we bring to the party is about sort of how we sort of do that nudging, getting people to nudge each other and what they're nudging towards has to be their own decision because it has to be their solution. So I think what we're talking about here is things like emergent change and it's all lovely wording, but um, it can be quite threatening as well because agile, I think inherently is a brilliant solution. It absolutely makes sense to not try to plan everything up front and to actually let things evolve in reaction to what's actually happening in the society and the marketplace. But it's incredibly threatening if you happen to be at the top of the organisation because you're going, what am I paying you for? What am I going to get at the end of it? What am I going to be able to say I achieved? And you go, well, it's an evolving solution. Well, you can say that, <coughs> then you get fired. Um, so I think we do have to sort of come up with a, a slightly better um, answer around, you know, um, the benefits of, of Agile. I don't think we've, we've mastered the art of the benefits of Agile yet, but I think um, we're, we're heading towards that. Um, and I think that going back to this idea of methodology and tools, um, I saw the, the, the tool that you put up there about the, um, the change management alignment uh, tool. But I think that one of the things we can offer in structure is also... It's great talking about agile and nudging people towards the right idea, but we also have to bring in a structure for measuring participation and measuring involvement. Because I think that if you say, um, we definitely want to encourage people to get involved and we want to help them find their own solutions, that's great. But if you're not keeping an eye on whether or not that's becoming real, if you're not measuring participation, which is excruciatingly difficult to do, um, but if we don't concentrate on doing that, in my 35,000 members of staff, 
trying to track if anybody have heard of the um, Accelerated Strategic Change Program, uh, whether or not they care, um, is incredibly difficult. But it's the only thing that will give me any sense of confidence that we're going to land these changes. Because if I don't measure the participation and involvement, um, and if I don't find that there is some, then actually all that happens is the change is talked about in meeting rooms like this with senior leaders. And that's the only thing that happens. They talk about the change, but the change isn't really happening. And I think the final reflection I'd make is we need to be really careful what we talk about when we talk about change, what we really mean. Because I think in senior leader meetings, what ends up being discussed is the easy bit, which is the tangible change. So it's the idea of we've commissioned people to redesign our processes. We are going to implement a new IT system. And that's great because actually all of the activities around that are project management based. They are timed activities. I can draw you up a project plan right now for any industry, uh, any country, about how I would um, redesign a set of processes or implement a system because it's been done so many times before. And it's actually creating a tangible change. But the only bit of change we're really interested in, because it's where the benefits come in, is if we actually get everybody to take on board and use what we've created on the project side. So I think there is this thing about the project management element of change creates the tangible change. What we're doing is about implementing, embedding, uh, transitioning. There's all sorts of words for it. But it's actually creating new ways of working or new ways of behaving. So we are actually in the business of helping people form new habits. So we're right back to the fact that, no, I haven't been to the gym more since my fir the 1st of January, my New Year's resolution, because I haven't yet embedded that habit. So even though I know how to build new habits in other people, I can't seem to make it work for myself. So that just sums up how difficult change really is, doesn't it? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh,